Uh, I'm Jim Menard, and I'm going to be talking about Ruby in the clouds, specifically the adventures that I've had bringing Ruby and Rails uh, and making them run on the 10 Gen cloud computing platform. So first of all, who the heck am I? Uh, I'm an old fart programmer. I've been programming since about 1980 and using Ruby since about 2001 uh, and Rails since the beginning. Uh, I, let's see now, I wrote NQXML, the first pure Ruby MIDI parser, uh, uh, XML parser, and MIDI lib, a MIDI file parser. That's just kind of develops my street cred before we get going. Of course, with a jacket on, I don't know if I have any street cred. Um, I joined TenGen in August. TenGen is a startup in New York City that is developing a cloud computing platform. The founders saw that they were solving the same problems over and over again for every startup they went to. How do I deploy my applications? I have to worry about uh, setting up systems, distrib distributing them, getting them running, managing them. So we're building a system where you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. It's a kind of a development and deployment platform. Uh, the most important reason I'm here today, though, actually, is less to tell you about how I did things and more to pique your interest so that you go download all this stuff because it's all open source. And what I'd really, really like is your feedback so that what I'm doing in Ruby and Rails and some of the compromises I'm making that I'll be talking about feel Rubyish and are Rubyish because I've had enough experience with other languages that I'm not always the pure Rubyist, uh, the best Rubyist that I can be. So how many of you have had experience running software in a cloud, first of all? Running your apps in the cloud. Okay. Um, how many of you have heard more than one definition of the word cloud? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so here, here's our definition. First of all, distributed deployment. There's more than one app server. There's more than one database server. They're in physically disparate locations. And they talk to each other, and you don't have to know about how or where they are. Second, it's scalable. Scalable in the sense that Zed Shaw defined a while ago in that resources are expandable at any time. If you need more CPU, more storage, more bandwidth, the system will magically take care of giving you more, whether you're running on more servers or not. You, uh, you don't care. And finally, we're developing what we call platform as a service, where the entire platform is available to you if you wish as a service on which you can deploy your apps. Or you can take our software and run it yourself. But the idea is that this whole platform is management free. You don't worry about the operating system and the machines and all that kind of thing if you're running it, for example, in our cloud. Um, this isn't a commercial for 10Gen, but since I'm developing for this particular platform, I kind of have to set the base of what this whole platform is about. The, the key takeaway point is that this cloud system is in many ways similar to other cloud systems. It's not terribly unique except for a couple of specific things. So on the left, we have a typical LAMP stack um, where at the bottom level, of course, you have the operating system, usually but not always Linux. On top of that, a database like MySQL, um, sometimes an object relational mapping layer. On top of that, memcached, uh, which just stands for something that helps with performance uh, that your application doesn't have to worry about. And on top of that sits a web server, such as Apache or Lighty or something like that. And finally, your application sits on top. And it is written in either Ruby or Python or PHP or some other language. Well, in the 10 Gen world, as in other cloud platforms, things are a little bit different. First of all, yes, there's an operating system under the covers, but you don't care or know what it is because you're not managing it. The second thing is that we have a database we've called Mongo. It's I want to say it's an object-oriented database. Technically, it's not. I'll get into that a little bit later. But basically, it's a distributed, grid-aware database that's non-relational. On top of that sits GridFS, a file storage system. It's not a file system. I'll be talking about that later. On top of that sits the app server we call Babel. And we call it Babel because it can run multiple languages. Um, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, PHP, more coming in the future. And the cool thing about that that I'll get into later is that each language can talk to the other languages and run code in the other languages in your application. Uh, so conceptually, the 10 Gen platform is much more similar to Google App Engine than anything else. Um, and this whole thing can run on our servers or your servers or an Amazon EC2 instance, for example. 
So I've already talked about these pieces. The platform consists of the app server, the database, some libraries and modules. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. They are available to you to use. They happen to be written in JavaScript. JavaScript was our first server-side language. Um, but that doesn't matter because your, your app can just use it if you want to. As I mentioned, it's available now. It's in alpha. We have two real customers, but it really is in alpha. Um, it's open source. You can go grab all of the source. Uh, Mongo's written in C++. Babel is written in Java. Uh, so you can compile them all. There are some dependencies, so it might be easier to download the SDK, which just pre-bundles, pre-packages some stuff for you. And you can, if you want, run your app on our, on our servers, in our cloud. So Babel itself, as I said, is written in Java. Uh, it supports a variety of languages. I've already talked about the libraries. It is server interface agnostic. We were trying to come up with a good phrase for this. There isn't a good phrase. But different web applications and different technologies require different ways to speak to the app server. For example, CGI is one of those ways. WSGI for Python, uh, Rack is another way in the Ruby world that you can plug your application into different app servers. Um, so we're server interface agnostic, and I'll show how you tell us which your app is going to use. And of course, with Rails, you'd use uh, CGI. So we have some frameworks already running on Babel, uh, specifically Rails, Google App Engine, and Django, already run on our platform. Um, the Rails support is pure Ruby. So there's nothing in the app server that knows it's running a Rails app. Um, the, the, a big caveat, various values of running. They're not all running all the way. They're not all running well. Active record support is not there for Rails yet. I have pre-pre-pre-pre-alpha stuff to show you. But the point here is that what we want to do is let you take your Rails app or Django or Google App Engine app, just deploy it on the cloud, and not change and not have to change anything, which also means you can take it away and not have to change anything. So there's no lock in here. So down below, the app server is GridFS. As I mentioned, it's not a file system, but it is file storage. The files are stored in the database. And since the database is aware of the cloud and available to all of the instances of your app running all over the cloud, so are these files. Um, the cool thing about these files is that you can attach metadata to them. So every single file can have its own metadata that you can attach in Ruby code. And I'll give, show you an example of that later. And it will be available next time you load the file. So the database, Mongo, as I mentioned, it's not relational. It's a document database. A couple of, I should bring buzzword bingo cards or something like that. I'm trying to avoid buzzwords, but it sometimes can't help it. Um, what we mean by collection-oriented storage is you don't have tables like you do in a relational database where each table stores a certain kind of thing. Instead, each collection in Mongo stores trees of objects. So your student object, which contains an address which, and, contains, uh, and references other courses that the student is taking, um, that's all stored in the database as one thing. Now, I lied it's not stored as an object. It's stored as a binary representation of JSON, basically. So it takes that hash-like complex structure and stores that in the database. The app server level is responsible for translating that into objects. And then my, my level is concerned with turning those into Ruby objects. Um, you can, when you run a query, you can query using sub-objects. So you can say, for example, Student, when I said the student contains an address, you could say in your query, student.address.city equals Orlando, and it will return all of those students. Um, two points here, though, that aren't up on the slide. One is you don't have to use Mongo with Babel, and you don't have to use Babel with Mongo. So you can use them separately. If you deploy this yourself, you can use the Babel app server and use MySQL instead. So you could just take your Rails app and start using MySQL with it right away. Um, and the other is that, again, this isn't specific. Having to think about bringing Ruby and, and Rails and things to this platform isn't specific to Mongo because any application that's going to run on a cloud that has a non-relational database has to think of all of these same issues. And so one thing I'm trying to do here is to learn how the other systems solve these problems and deal with the mismatch between object relational mapping and pure object storage. I'm going to whip through these features because they're not, they're not key to this presentation. Mongo has the basics create, update, and delete, indexing, sorting, limit, offset, regular expression searches, full text search. Um, you can run code on the database server. I'm going to talk about that a little while later. But the idea is, is that the code 
is in any language. So you can send Ruby code over and run the Ruby code on the database server. The idea, of course, being if your query has to perform com complex calculations, you want those calculations to run on the database server so you don't have to send data back just to see if the record matches your query. Um, of course, it does replicate, Mongo does replication because it has to be to, to live on the cloud. Coming soon, locking and sharding. Um, they just a little bit, we're, we're getting to those right now. So what languages do we support now? JavaScript, PHP, Python, Ruby, more under consideration. For example, we're considering exposing Java because Java is the language the whole the, the app servers run on. Um, the point again I want to make here is that any of the code running in any of these languages can call and use code running in any of the other languages, which makes my job a little tricky, but fun. So to run Ruby on Babel, we use JRuby 114. I just took a look at 115, which came out a couple of days ago, and there are some changes in the Java interfaces to the Ruby classes, so it's going to take me a, a little while to get that going, but that will come soon. Uh, right now, we're running Ruby 186, whatever uh, version of 18 that uh, JRuby runs. I have an internal flag for running Ruby 1.9 through JRuby. I have not yet exposed that publicly, but I'm looking to do that, and I'm trying to look of A, the cleanest way to do that. I don't think I can auto detect it. So you're going to have to tell me you're running 1.8 or 1.9, and I want to make that as painless as possible. And I had a B, and I don't remember offhand what it was. But as I mentioned, uh, in this world, JavaScript is the, the, the lingua franca. It's kind of the first among equals. So a lot of the issues I've had to deal with have been, it, of course, JRuby does a beautiful job of translating Ruby objects to Java objects and back and letting them talk to each other very nicely. Well, I can't use any of that because the, the, exchange between, uh, the exchange between code when you're calling other code is done using the JavaScript object model and JavaScript functions. So we have wrappers for that. I'll be talking about all this more in a couple of slides. The other thing you have to consider when you're running uh, in any environment, actually, is what scope are you running in? Uh, in other words, what information do I need about the environment? And in a platform where you can have multiple languages running, when one language calls another, it may have information to pass in. That gets passed in through the scope, and likewise, information can pass back up. So our scope contains a lot of stuff, but, but the basics it contains uh, the object representing the database, the object representing the application context, the, the app server context, including the request and the response, um, some globally available classes. They're JavaScript classes, but in Ruby, you can treat them just like Ruby classes and instantiate them in subclass and all of that. Um, there are some top-level functions. Uh, that are available, and these things we call file libraries, which are, which are essentially load paths. We have three magic load paths that I'll talk about later. So the functions that are in the scope, the top-level functions, I put into a top-level module called XGen, and that gets included in objects just like kernel does. So all of those top-level objects that were defined in the app server are available to all of your objects if you wish to use them. Likewise, the objects that are in the scope, well, first of all, the scope itself becomes a global object called dollar scope, and all of the objects in the scope become global objects too. This is one decision that I've made that I'd like to hear more feedback about. Does that make sense? It, does it sound really stupid? Um, so I'd love to get your feedback on how that feels when you start playing with it. Or do our globals so darn evil that there's a better way to do this, or a more Ruby-like way to do this? Aside from the database instance, your user code probably won't be using many of these global objects anyway. Uh, some of the glue code does. All of the glue code, again, is written in Ruby, and it will use things like sometimes the request object or the response object uh, to set up input and output. Um, when you modify one of these globals, it goes back into the scope, and likewise, when you create new global globals, they go back into the scope and they're available for other code in other languages. So how do you call other code? Well, by using require or load. It looks just like any other Ruby uh, file call. Um, so what I've done is overridden uh, require and load so that the first thing it does is call the regular require and load. So normal behavior doesn't change at all. There's no change. Um, but if that fails, then the next thing it does is try again using the internal loader which knows about other languages. And these, first, these three things, local core and external, are the three file libraries, or essentially additions to the, to the load path. If you prefix the file 
path with load slash or core slash or external slash, I'll look in those three magic places. So far I've done that instead of adding those three to the load path, that's an internal discussion we have around uh, security for example. Uh, because since you're running on a server that may be running other applications, we are going to have to limit your exposure to the file system. And that will include limiting what you can do with the load path. Um, that XGen module I talked about also holds on to some other things. Um, there's a sub module called Mongo that holds on to database related classes. These are Ruby classes um, that are wrappers around the JavaScript classes for uh, the object ID ob I just said the object ID object. Hmm. Uh, for cursor base and for doing logging. All logging is done to the database. And the XGen Rails module has only one thing in it right now, although there's lots of other Rails stuff, uh, that contains the implementation of the session storage adapter. Because as you may know in Rails, you can decide whether sessions are stored on disk or in the database or uh, one or two other ways. Well, there's one more way here, storing it into the distributed database. And again, that makes perfect sense because now when your sessions live in a distributed database, then no matter where the request comes in, you don't care about load balancing, you don't care about any of that because the session object is always available to all of the instances of your application. Um, I've exposed the gridfs file store through a class I've called gridfile, which feels a lot like a Ruby file. So very simply when you require its class, you can open it for writing, open it for reading, open it for appending, and under the covers right now, it uses string IO and slurps the contents of the file into a string. I know that's a very, very bad thing to do, but right now the Java implementation underneath doesn't know how to append stuff. You have to go through, jump through hoops. So once I fix that in the app server, this will go away and this will be, this will not slurp the data into memory until you need it, which is of course what you want to do. Um, the thing I'm not showing here is that grid files can have attributes. So again, here's where I want to open it up to the community. What should this look like? What I did right now is you could say f and treat f like a hash and say f bracket foo equals 42. And now you've just set the attribute foo to the value 42. And the next time you read it, you could read f dot foo, I'm sorry, or f bracket foo and get to it. What I bumped my head into was if f looks like a hash, but it also looks like a file, what does the each method return. What, what does it iterate over? Does it iterate over lines in the content? Does it iterate over characters? Or does it iterate over these attributes, the key values? Uh, so again, my, right now I'm leaning towards hiding the attributes, not hiding them, excuse me, putting them in a sub-object. So you'd say f.attribute and then access them that way. But again, uh, opinions on how that should look and what feels, feels most Ruby-like would be greatly appreciated. Logging, I said, happens to the database um, using a capped collection. A capped collection is simply a database collection that, in which you specify a maximum size, a maximum byte size, and optionally a maximum number of records. And so old records get purged as new ones come in. Um, how do you use it? Well, if you look in the, um, the Ruby logger code, you'll see that it uses this thing called a log device. I just made one of them that knows how to write to the database. It was really as simple as that. And again, it's pure Ruby. And it uses that $db object and that's all it uses. It's even slightly magical. We have a command line shell that is, it's not too surprising. If, when it fires up, by default it fires, in, fires up using uh, JavaScript. But if you say shell minus minus Ruby, it will use IRB. It's really IRB, it's really sitting there, and there's just a, a little bit of code that hooks it up to the app server. So the biggest challenge I've had so far as I mentioned is in reconciling different object models when getting Ruby to run in the cloud. Um, a JavaScript, uh, how many people are familiar with JavaScript enough to know about its inheritance model and how you access instance variables? Okay, a couple of you. Um, I'm going to greatly simplify and get it wrong by saying a JavaScript object feels an awful lot like a hash with some magical syntax and a different object inheritance model. You don't inherit through using classes in JavaScript, you inherit through using prototyping, which means you don't say I'm not, my it's not that my class is this class, it's that I'm like that guy over there, except I, go, except I do these things differently. So a very different object model. 
So I mentioned I have to, to, uh, to use these wrappers. A JavaScript object, when it, when it comes into Ruby, becomes a class called JS object, which subclasses hash. It's sort of like a, a hash plus plus, if you will. If you look at the top section here, um, this would be legal in both JavaScript and in Ruby, in Babel. The first line is pure and simple. The object has um, keys and values. And so you access a key just like you do a hash in Ruby. The second is magic I do in Ruby, which is essentially, it's essentially an accessor method. But in JavaScript, those two things are exactly the same. I expose them the same way in Ruby, but you don't have to worry about the, that. You can treat it just like a hash if you wish, wish. Until you get to functions. Because this object, objects can have functions hanging off of them, of course. And you just write, you call, just like you would any other function. The JS object dot woogie, and you pass in your argument. And that call calls a JavaScript function and bundles your arguments up into JavaScript objects as they go in and calls it as JavaScript code. Um, JavaScript array objects become JS array, which is again a subclass of Ruby array with a few extra features because JS JavaScript objects are a little more complex. Um, a JavaScript con constructor function becomes a class in Ruby so that you really can instantiate those objects and subclass them and do all that kind of nice stuff. Likewise, a Ruby class, which you can pass in to certain library methods we have, becomes a constructor function. So when you call the constructor function in JavaScript land, you end up getting a wrapped Ruby object. Finally, um, I mentioned functions in the scope turn into plain old functions or methods on, in the XGen module. But if you have to take a Ruby block and turn it in and give it to JavaScript as a JavaScript function, you can do that too. Um, an example down here, this, this last line, if you can see it, it, the first thing is the database object. The second thing, dot x, is just a collection. That's a JavaScript object too. Dot find, that's a JavaScript function called on the JavaScript method, and that will return all of the objects in that collection. Except it doesn't. It returns a cursor object. The cursor object has an each method, because JavaScripters like iterating just like us Rubyists Ruby do. But I need to pass to it a JavaScript function. What I can do in my Ruby code is pass in a block and the block gets bundled right up, turned into a JavaScript object. So everything up to the first curly brace is pure JavaScript. And I pass the, pass the block in, it turns into a function, and it gets called with no problem. So um, I, I mentioned before, wouldn't it be nice if I could just use JRuby's built-in native Ruby to Java and Java to Ruby? Um, in fact, I had a good chunk of this stuff running early. Everything was pure Ruby with no wrappers whatsoever until I came to a particular problem. Our, our JavaScript is written in Java. It, we're not using JRhino yet. And I found that the database collection object, the one that has the find method, has a JavaScript function called find and a Java function called find. And the way JRuby is written, if you wrap a Java object, it will always insist upon using the Java function and you have no way of overriding that. You have no way of, of putting a hook into that. It's declared private, static, final only on Thursdays if you have the secret password. You'd really have to hack into, into JRuby very deeply to change that behavior. So that led me to having to write these wrappers. But the wrappers themselves are fairly light, lightweight. And I go to great troubles to make sure that they're cached so once you wrap something in either direction, it's only used once for that runtime. Uh, another instance running in another runtime will get another wrapper. Um, the connection to the app server, uh, you have to declare that because Babel doesn't know whether you want to use CGI or Rack or anything else. So that's a one-line configuration script, uh, uh, one line in a, in a little configuration file. I put threading up here just as a, a token resource um, to show that in any application environment where you're running more than one application, especially more than one application by different people in different languages, you have to lock down resources to a certain extent. We can't let you create a bazillion threads because it'll take over the machine. We can't let you fill up the file system or anything like that. So we're starting to look at sandboxing and how that will affect applications. It won't affect how you write your code. It might affect what you're able to do. So 
thinking in pure Ruby, there are basically three, three ways right now to get to this distributed database um, with native queries, and that is uh, JavaScript objects in Ruby land. And you notice the arguments are hashes, which are turned into JSON uh, on the server side. And notice that the, we're searching by name using a regular expression that turns into, into a JavaScript regular expression. Um, secondly, I've come up with a class called XGen Mongo Base, which is really, really similar to Active Record Base, uh, as far as it can be. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a couple of slides. Here's a simple example, and hopefully it looks really familiar because you could drop that into an Active Record app and it would run exactly the same. Finally, I'm run, working on getting Active Record running. Uh, there are a couple of challenges there, not the least of which is that Active Record assumes that it's using SQL and running with a relational database. It's fairly insistent upon that. Um, so all I, I, I have it running now, doing some very simple things. If we have time, I'll, I'll show you later. Um, but I, something I forgot to mention earlier, uh, or I glossed over, is that Mongo is schema free. Each collection doesn't know or care what's stored in it. There is no schema. So when you insert something into a collection, it'll take the fields and just store them. The next thing may have the same set of fields and it may not, and Mongo doesn't care. Well, Active Record cares very much. So what I do is, uh, lazily, the first time it's needed, I read the db slash schema.rb file, which is a Ruby description of your schema. And so it'll set up all, so it, lets the code know about your tables and know about the columns and their types and everything like that and uh, sets up indexes too. So if you've defined indexes, they'll be in there and the Mongo database will have its indexes set up as well. Um, I just threw up object ID here because not Mongo but the app server requires that the primary key of every object be one of these things. But in Rubyland, I've done as much as possible to make sure you just treat it as a string. So it's essentially a string key called underscore ID. Um, I pointed out earlier you can use Mongo without Babel and vice versa. And so we're looking to get pure uh, Ruby native driver for Mongo. Uh, we haven't had the time to do that yet. If anybody's interested, we'd love to talk to you about that. Come see me after. Um, and we'll give you as much information as you need. Or you can just go download the source and start hacking away. Two seconds on XGen Mongo Base. Its a API is very similar to Active Record Base. There's one additional feature that I mentioned earlier that Mongo knows how to run your code on the database server. The problem is getting the code there. Um, it needs the source code. And the bad news is in JRuby land, once Ruby is compiled, you can't get to the source code. So, there are three options as I see it right now, and I'm really open to discussing this and, and, and getting feedback. Um, first of all, we're considering internally a SQL-like language, and we've experimented with it already, and the source code is out there. Um, second of all, I'm looking at hacking JRuby, but I don't have that much JRuby foo yet, and getting into the AST and the parser and all that uh, is going to take me a while to do and to find out if it's even possible. Third, as a really horrible compromise, you can send over a string that contains the function definition. I will see an example of that later. Um, it works, it's not elegant, and it's not nice. We know that. Um, let's take a very brief look at some sample code. And here's where I... So the first thing up top is an XGen Mongo base class, and it looks awfully similar to uh, an active record class, except for the first two things, instead of a table name, I say, you say collection name, and you have to tell it, remember this isn't the code that looks at DB schema because we're not talking about Rails right now, you have to tell me what fields you want to persist to the database. The nice thing, you notice created at and updated at are there, well the magic that happens in Rails also happens in XGen, XGen Mongo base those fields get updated for you automatically without you having to worry about them. Other than that, this class has one address and has many scores, so that's an array of objects. When you save this student, the entire tree of objects is saved into the collection name students. The controller is amazingly unexciting, and that's a good thing because it is the exact same as any other active record controller. There's nothing to see here. Um, 
This comes, these examples come right from the R doc for the find method in XGen Mongo base. So I'm not going to go over them in detail except to say that they should look awfully, 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 awfully really familiar. Um, it can't do everything Active Record does, but it can do an awful lot. Um, this example right here shows the horrible, horrible hack of passing a JavaScript function in as text to the database server. I'm not proud of it, but there it is. Okay, so how do you run Ruby? Again, forget about Rails. How do you run Ruby on Babel? Well, it only needs to know a couple of things. Um, Ruby needs to know about standard in and standard out, and Babel needs to know um, where, to send, where to send those things, and I'm sorry, what's the other thing? My mind blanked. Um, we also support ERB natively, so if you point the app server to a foo.erb, it will just run as ERB. Um, to set this up, you're, you have to have a ma one magic file that contains, I didn't show, yeah, one, this magic file contains a function defined in Ruby that is essentially a mini router. I showed a really simple example that's formatted very badly to just let it fit on the screen, but this function, which gets shoved into a global object so the app server can see it, gets two arguments, the URI and the request. So you can look at the URI, match it with regular expressions, um, and send it on to whichever of your Ruby files you want. So the nice thing about getting Rails running is that if Ruby is already running, there's not much to it. Rails has to know about its environment. I get that from the name of the server you're running on, basically. And if you're running, on your con you're running in development, it just assumes it's development. Um, database we've talked about. It has to know, uh, Babel has to know about that, that Rails wants CGI and where to store the sessions. We already talked about that. Um, it would be nice if Rails didn't have to worry about serving public files just like it doesn't now in most cases. So the magic init file I'm going to show you sets up a sort of meta routing where it looks at the URL first and if the URL is, f if that file is found in the public directory, it serves that direct directly without having to go to Rails. Logging goes to the database and we set up the default Rails logger for you so you can just use logging normally as you would in Rails and it works. And finally, uh, uh, a uh, user in Brazil is working on a generator for generating uh, XGen Mongo base objects. How do you get ra your Rails app onto Babel? It's really simple. First, you freeze Rails. We don't ship Rails. We don't want to tie you to any particular version, so you just freeze it. Second, you add two tiny, tiny files we're going to see in a second. And third, you have to figure out how you're going to talk to the database. Either use XGen Mongo base, active record which isn't ready yet, or if you're not running in our cloud, you can use MySQL or any other persistence mechanism, and it just doesn't matter. So here are the two small files. At the top level of your applica application, you need a magic file underscore init. And that could be .rb, .js, .py for Python, it doesn't matter. Um, but in Rails land, you just need that one magic init file, which does a couple of things. It tells Babel to use CGI, and it sets up that meta routing I talked about, which serves public files directly. And finally, the next thing it does is it says, send all requests to public XGen dispatch, which is a new file. And that includes a file which does a little bit more. It sets the Rails env, creates the default logger, requires both active record and the XGen Mongo stuff. Um, then it runs the normal Rails configuration, so everything you've got in your existing Rails config just works. Um, creates a new session storage, session storage adapter, excuse me, and then calls the regular dispatcher, and now you're in pure Rails land. Um, I've got time to show you these apps running, if you're interested, both a uh, XGen Mongo base version and an active record version. And since I'm getting towards the end, I might as well fire that up and show you, because um, it'll also show you how to start things. So here's the live demo part that could come crashing down on my head. We'll see. I am using the, the, the raw source version rather than the SDK. In the SDK, it's a one-line startup instead of a two-line startup. So first thing I do is, wow, it's a little tough to type this way, is start Mongo. The database is now running. Next, I start up the app server and point it to the root directory of my application. 
and it rebuilds, well, because I'm running the development version, it, it rebuilds everything and then starts running and now it's listening. Now I come over here, localhost 8080, and I'm going to let you see this for a second, A, to show you that when it's starting up, it's painful right now. We want to speed this up. But B, to point out that just like with Rails, if you change one of your files, you don't have to restart everything. So I don't want to scare you by the fact that it's taking so long to start up. That's a one-time thing. So here's my Ruby on Rails on Babel application. Um, it uses two different database collections, a collection of courses and a collection of students. Each student holds on, has an address and the scores or the, the grades that they've had in each class. So where's my mouse? Here's the part where I panic, here we go. So this is pure, simple, dumb little Rails app that has nothing exciting about it except the models are different right now in this version, what we're seeing here. Um, if I go to the students, I'm showing the name, email, address, the scores, which, so let's, let's add a score to Bender and we'll say that he took um, buggy whip repair and only got a 2-0 in the course. Now if we look at the controller, what we'll see just happened is the code retrieved that course object from the database and shoved it inside the student. So it is now inside an array in the student. So you might think now we have two of the same object in two different places. Well, the app server and Mongo are clever enough to do what is essentially a foreign key. When you start saving an object, it looks at all the IDs and it says, oh wait, I know about that object, I know what collection it's stored in, and so I sa save a DB ref, we call it, it's essentially a foreign key. So you deal with objects, we worry about the foreign keys, not you. Um, I whipped up a little page that shows the logs that are stored in the database, so these are the these are the logs that are stored there. And I also whipped up a little page that shows that sessions actually work. It's not very exciting, but if I were to open up two browsers, you'd see the number increment every time I refresh the page here, and every time I re refresh it somewhere else, and if we were running on multiple machines, it would all work magically and, and happily. So ta-da, that's done. But now what I'd like to do is show you an active record app. And here's where I really cross my fingers and wave my hands a lot because there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work yet. So I took the code from the uh, Pragmatic Programmer's application development in Rails and downloaded it from their site and unpackaged it and didn't change a thing. So the Rails app itself has not changed. It is pure active record. It's everything that came out of the book. And once again, I do a song and dance while things load. Um, so what you'll see is the, the main store come up and it's going to show some products that were retrieved from the database. It essentially did a find all. Um, I loaded the data into the database by taking the migration, one of the migrations they have loads test data. So I just turned that, took that and extracted it and just ran it from our shell and did nothing else. So that really is using active record to really um, retrieve the data. Here's where I wave my hands and I don't think it's going to work correctly. I set up the 10 gen user just like they did. And it didn't work and I've got a bug that I introduced a couple of days ago so wave my hands. Um, now that would have taken you actually to a pay, the, the URL admin. And here's where we have a glaring hole in our architecture. We right now reserve a couple of URLs and that's really, really horrible and evil and we know it and we're going to change it and I apologize for it right now. This is the admin interface for your app running in the cloud or on your machine. So you can actually look in the database. Here, here's the products collection and we can look at it and see what's inside of it. Delete records and search. Uh, you can look at the raw logs do some profiling and stuff like that. I'm not going to get into any of that right now. I want to wrap up by saying, uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. 
Um, I hope that I haven't put you to sleep and you've got at least a vague interest in downloading this and trying it. Uh, go to www.tengen.com. Uh, we also have you know, mailing lists and blogs and all that kind of thing. Uh, the code is available there. Uh, it'll point to our GitHub repository. Yes? So until you get active record working, uh, somebody with an existing Rails app would have just about no chance of getting this working on the engine. In our cloud, correct. Yeah. But on their own machines, you could run it with MySQL with no problem. Yes, the entire stack you can run on your machines. It's open source. Get it, grab it, run it, and get it, and, and, and get it running. But the kind of the big cool thing about that is that you can just run it the cloud. Absolutely, and not have to worry about management and such, yes. And so I just started this active record work a couple of weeks ago, and it's so weak, and there's going to be a lot of thinking and planning and doing to get it running as close as I can to real active record. Yes. So it's not ready yet. Thing in your talk, so I mean, well, forgive me, but um, how are you, from a business point of view, how are you guys trying to um, compete with something like Google App Engine? <coughs> from a business, the question was, I'm sorry, I didn't repeat your question, sir. From a business perspective, how are we going to compete with Google? Yeah. Um, I'm not a business guy, so I don't have a ready packaged answer to that question. But basically, A, we've got more languages out of the box. B, it's completely open source. C, you can run it yourself. So those are interesting enough differentiators that we hope you at least take a look and consider us. Have you tested with billions of records in the Mongo database? Billions, no. Millions, yes. It does some operations faster than others, and we know where we have to make it better. It's, uh, so it's much, much faster than MySQL at doing certain kinds of things, but not, but not others. And I don't know what they are. I don't have that information with me. Ask and support transactions in the database yet? Not yet. Locking is coming. Yep. And we don't know at what level that will be yet. Record level, uh, collection level, I would hope it would be record level. That's what, that's what we're planning, is record level locking. Yes? Uh, is it conceivable that TensGen can be used to make a sort of semi at home type application where the clients are distributed you know, around the world and internally cool? Yeah, the, the question is, could TenGen be used to create a SETI at home type application where many, many, many different clients are running a distributed application? Um, excuse me. I'm going to say no because the hard, the, they'd all have to be running, hmm. Good question, I'm not sure. I haven't thought about how that would be architected. Right now, it's intended to be used as kind of part of a server farm. When the clients become part of that server farm, now the infrastructure has to know where all of those clients are at all times. And I believe that that part of our infrastructure is, assumes that everything knows where everything else is at all times. So I don't think it's ready for clients to be dropping in and out. I'm not sure it's ready for that kind of application. But that's something I want to take back to the people at Tengen and ask if they've thought about that kind of application. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes? This may be premature, but what's the performance on, on the stack? Because you're introducing middleware in that layer, so you're obviously losing some performance, but you need kind of the horizontal scalability. So what, what is that trade-off? The, the question was about performance. Um, since these languages can talk to each other and there are wrappers involved, that degrades performance. But on the other hand, this whole thing is designed to be scalable horizontally, so more servers get added magically for you when you need them. Um, and how does that affect, what's the overall performance gain or lose? Boy, that's a good question. We're early enough that we know we want the scalability to matter much, much more than the wrapping. And we know we can do it, and we've got bright enough people to do it. And we're already working on that, but I don't have any hard numbers for you yet. So I have to wave my hands. I'm sorry. Yeah. What do you anticipate to be the biggest bottleneck? What do I anticipate to be the biggest bottleneck? Would it be the database or the app server? What would that component be? Is it going to be the database or the app server? The, the um, app server and database connect over a raw socket, so that's not going to be a big bottleneck. Um, and they scale independently, so that is not a big bottleneck either. Um, I think it might be the context switching, so, so we're going to have to worry about that most. First, we want to get it running, get it running right, and then get it to perform. Uh, we're, we're at the late stages of get it running and, the early of, and, and getting it running right. 
So we're not yet at performance, but we've got enough bright people that that's why, that's why I'm there, because I want to learn from them. Yes? So I'm curious to know why JavaScript is your choice for Lingua Franca. So am I. The question was, I'm curious to know why JavaScript was chosen as the Lingua Franca. The reason we gave on our website is because application developers are using JavaScript on the client. Why not let them use the same language on the server? It's partly because one of the founders did this really cool implementation of JavaScript that's really fast, and it was first. Um, it may not be the lingua franca forever. The founder and the, uh, the head of technology are still talking about that, and they have differences of opinion, and we're still, work we're, we're still very early stage and we're working on that. It may not be the lingua franca for very long. And so that may take away some of the wrapping issues because we were having internal tech discussions and among other things I was saying, look, if I didn't have to translate to JavaScript and I could just use pure JRuby, I could throw away 80% of the code I've written and it would be faster. And the Python guy said the same thing. He said, same here, I'm using Jython. I have to spend a lot of time worrying about those wrappers. All that would go away. So there is interest in getting rid of that and getting rid of the context switch problems and we'd be more performant. Let me just check the time. My time is officially out. So I would like to thank you very much for your patience and kindness. Thank you.